Welcome to the Your Music Industry Podcast. The podcast that gives you a direct route into the music industry's greatest minds. Your Music Industry is proudly brought to you by the Liverpool Audio Network with your host, Daniel Fisher-Jones. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Your Music Industry Podcast, where it is my mission to connect you to music industry insight, wisdom and knowledge from the established and successful. Today's episode is brought to you in collaboration with Warrior Sound. Warrior Sound have very recently released a brand new online course called 21 Ways to Monetize Your Music. And as a listener of today's episode, you have the opportunity to win. We have not one, not two, but 10 passes to give away to the course. So if you fancy the chance of winning, stay tuned and we'll be announcing how you can win in around 20 minutes. And funny enough, today's podcast guest is the one and only founder of Warrior Sound. You might know him as Unders or Scott Robinson. Welcome, Scott, also known as Unders of Warrior Sound to the Your Music Industry podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, no, it's good to you. see you again. It's been a little while. Yeah, it's been a little while since the Electronic Sound Summit. Yeah, which was great. Looking forward to next year's for yeah, that. 2020. The, yeah. the planning's already happening with Phil and Keen right now. So Amazing. Yeah, can't wait for it. Amazing. It's exciting. awesome that the team's growing as well. That's mm. good to see. Yeah. Some of the brands have actually got on board already. Uh, top of the game, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a big step up next year, which is exciting. And we'd love to see Unders return. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, uh, we'll work out what's a, a good positive talk. Mm. So on the topic of you did a talk, mm-hmm. I watched the video you put on LinkedIn, I believe. And within the first few minutes, you mentioned something of your background, particularly a certain field that isn't music related. Okay. So could you talk us through your journey into music and what happened before you walked into the world of electronic music? Okay, so like the, the thing that you're referring to was kind of like a, a little intersection more than anything. So before, before that, like we can go back to, um, probably I think 2007. Um, I'd done like an HND in music production. And I'd done a little bit of like sound engineering and a couple of bits for websites and stuff like that, like really minor work, like, um, you know, little like promo videos doing little background tracks for that and things like that. And, uh, I went to work at Point Blank. Mm. Um, Point Blank was a really great place to be, but unfortunately I decided not to stay because the pay actually worked out so little after my rent. It left me with about 150 pounds a month to live off. So I didn't carry on doing that. Um, and I went into, sort of tied into audio, like construction, but doing um, like acoustic treatment. So I ended up in places like MOD offices and learning about acoustics in offices and soundproofing booths and things like that. And then from that, after doing that for a while, I ended up as a sound engineer. So I started my first place, I think was Honey in Brighton, where just from... Being frankly good at the job and networking well, I ended up picking up loads more work mm. and some um, like quick rush things. And I ended up doing other clubs in Brighton and then promoters that really liked what I was doing at their night were like, can you come and do such and such night? And I, it just rolled off from that. Uh, and that picked up really well. I got to work with, with some like amazing names. Like, um, did Carl Cox's birthday. Uh, did a private event with Judge Jules. That was mm. wicked. Um, got called in at the last minute to cover Skrillex. That was, that was insane to see, um, like that touring level. Like he landed in the UK, was here about four hours, played his set and got another flight to go somewhere else and play another set that night. That was just insane. And here's me stressing about getting the train home. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, it was insane to get that perspective. Um, and I bounced around like that for a while, like did festivals, like sometimes I would do a festival six hours in the day, um, come back, sleep for a couple of hours, go out and do a six hour venue in the night, go home, sleep for a couple of hours, do the festival again and just repeat that. Um, but then in the winter, like after the summer season, it would just wind down. You wouldn't really have to do too much. There'd be like the odd like corporate event and stuff. And then the Christmas parties and New Year's really busy and then it dies off again as we ramp up, back up into spring you start that cycle again you kind of do your year's work in like a four or five month window mm. chill the rest 
Um, it was really, really good. However, through all of that, as much as it was building up, I kind of hit like a glass ceiling. Um, I couldn't move any further and I had kind of mastered what I was doing. Uh, it became a bit tiresome. So I looked at going into the military, which I'd always wanted to do and hadn't been able to. Um, I had like a previous injury where I'd dislocated my shoulder and had a trapped nerve. That stopped me going in for four years and I just never really um, picked it back up from there. But I looked to go and do comms um, and decided if I was going to go in the military, I may as well learn something relevant to what I already do. Mm. And I went for the Royal Marines because if I was going to go in and risk it, I wanted to go in at the highest possible level that I could. Um, so I went in and, yeah, looked at doing the Royal Marines and only lasted a couple of years in the end. Uh, ended up taking an injury again, ironically, um, which was two ruptured ligaments and a broken knee. Uh, that basically ended that career. Mm. In that time, because I was away, my partner had moved up here. Um, so me coming out early, we ended up basically living up here because of where she was working, at which point I didn't have any connections whatsoever in terms of the music industry. And it turns out the venues and whatnot up here just operated in a completely different way. Um, people wanted me to come and do nights for free, not necessarily with any guarantee of like work after that. It's just something I couldn't do. Mm. So I started looking for a regular job and I actually ended up going to SAE. So I couldn't go do a second qualification. Um, while at SAE, ended up working for another corporate company and basically hammered through that in two years. And within the two years of SAE, I like gradually started to get independent and make new connections within Liverpool, meet up with you guys uh, and just build as many connections as possible and mm. carried on freelancing from there to essentially what I'm doing now. Wow. it's a quick summary. Yeah, yeah. Something that's just really hit me, which you mentioned in the sound engineering days to kind of up to now, is your insane work ethic. Mm -hmm. How how have you moulded that? Has it just become natural or is it something you've kind of worked on? Or um, So I'm super lucky in that I'm, I was born oddly driven. And if I do decide I'm going to go, go and do something, I don't procrastinate, I just do it. I see uh, lots and lots of people really, really, really struggle with like this aspect. I'm, I'm lucky in that I just get on with things. Mm. Um, so, like, decided to join the Royal Marines, for example, when uh, when I went to join the um, PJFT, which was pre-joining fitness test, is a three mile run split into two. Uh, the first half is twelve and a half minutes, and the second part they wanted in nine minutes or less. Um, that's obviously like pretty horrendous undertaking straight off the bat. Then it's 60 press ups in two minutes, 80 sit ups in two minutes, 10 pull ups, um, swim the length of two pools. And then you've got your, your endurance tests and everything after that. So once I read through all that, I was like, okay, that's what I've got to do. And I just focused on that every single day. So while sound engineering, um, I would like finish at like four in the morning, cycle back, drop in the gym do a three mile run and a bit of weights, cycle back home, sleep, wake up, run 12 miles, um, have breakfast or dinner or whatever time of day it was, <laughs> depending on that particular lifestyle, uh, and then go out and work again. So I just, yeah, I was lucky that I was just driven. I, this is what I wanted to do. These are the steps I've got to take, go and execute on them. Mm. Um, I still do that to a degree. I get distracted a bit more now because adult life has a lot more distractions that it throws at you. But yeah, generally, I'm just very lucky to automatically have that mindset. Mm. So having that mindset, has that really helped you with unders of Warrior Sound in general? Is it just, you've just threw yourself at it and it's just grew organically, would you say? Um, just... Yeah, yes and no. So I didn't really know what I was doing. I don't really know how to run my own business or anything like that. So it's just a case of figuring it out. Um and I would do a bit of research, go, cool, this might be the thing that I need to do. I'll do that and put loads of energy into it and then see what happens and just repeatedly test that. Um, obviously, like the YouTube thing became the most uh, like, important for building what I'm trying to build. So I put a little bit of energy into that and then saw it works. Okay, 
now I'm going to put all of my energy into it. And like the first year I did it, I went daily on videos, which like some people don't recommend doing because it's incredibly taxing. It is incredibly taxing. Um, back down to doing regularly three to four a week. But that gave me enough data to know, cool, this is the direction to push it in. Mm. And by going all in really early on, I know straight away that that's what you're going to get out of it. And if you only put 10% into something, you're probably actually going to get zero back. So one of my mentors uh, puts this point across really, really, really well that drives it home. So imagine there's this concrete wall and on the other side of that concrete wall is the thing that you're after, whatever it is. Um, but to get through that concrete wall, it's going to take one million points of energy. And every single day you wake up with a thousand points of energy. If you put a hundred points into browsing YouTube and then you mess about doing something else and then you go and do your day job and you've only got 300 points to put back in to breaking through that wall, you're not going to do it in your lifetime. You need to wake up every day and put 999 points of energy into getting through that wall and save one point for all the other things. If you keep doing that consistently, eventually you start waking up and you've got 1,100 points of energy that you can throw into that wall. And eventually you wake up and you've got 5,000 and you can start doing other things again and put four times the amount you used to because you become more efficient and learn a lot more at it. And eventually you're going to break through that wall because you've put everything you've got into it and become better at it and more efficient at it. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. Like You can apply it to many things like the gym. You want to lift a certain weight, you need to go and practice lifting that mm. certain weight. If you go into the gym and you go for a run and you have a chat and then you have a drink with your body and you don't actually do the lift, you don't get better at it. it you don't get to that goal. Uh, it was just an analogy that worked really well for me. Like You wake up, you've got that bit of energy, apply it to that thing and you one, progress towards that thing and to get better, uh, more efficient at doing it each time. So with that analogy, do you have times when you don't want to do something? Yeah, everyone has a time where they, they wake up and they don't want to do a particular thing. And uh, like anyone, sometimes if there's uh, something I, I've worked really hard at and I've like been flat out rejected or there's someone I've got to respond to go, yeah, actually, this, we're not going to be able to do this thing and it's bad news for them. Of course you don't want to do that. But if you get those bad negative things out of the way, you can move on to the progressing and the positive things. Uh, it gets worse and worse. Like cleaning the house is probably the best example here, right? If you just let it stack up and stack up, it's an overwhelm of things that you don't want to do. Whereas if you just do a little bit every single day, it, it cleans itself up, if you will. Mm. And yeah, there's always wake up and I, I don't want to do some things. And some days, like I absolutely suffer with burnout. So um, I'm, I'm taking this whole week off because I haven't really stopped but it took me to the point of waking up and going I really haven't got the energy to do this to go oh, actually that's why I've not stopped for three months and haven't taken any days and time off um, but like if you always wake up and you don't want to do something you're not doing the right thing Simple. that's the big takeaway from it like if you wake up every day for your nine to five and you hate it you're not doing the right thing you should be doing something else You've only got one life. Like, don't waste 80% of it. Mm. It's just not worth it. Go and find something else and proactively put your energy into finding that. And again, you've got your wall with a million points. If there's a big thing at the end of it, put all your energy into it each day. Um, you have to save a little bit to do your job. But if you hate it, honestly, like, don't put all your energy into it. <laughs> so a lot of your energy has gone into YouTube. Initially, when you started on YouTube, did you have a vision of what you wanted to be or was it more you just throwing yourself at YouTube and being like, let's see what happens? Yeah, YouTube was a curiosity thing. It was, I can see how this might work, but I don't really understand how. So mm. my way to understand how is to put loads of energy into it uh, and get like data back, if you will. Um, data in the terms of people talking to me, does it respond, do videos get viewed, are people actually interested in this? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's it really. It was just throw energy into it. And if it worked, great. I could see that it was working for other people as well. Um, so like obviously we met Multiplayer and things like that through doing it. And he's grown, he's consistently stayed about 10 times the size of my channel, 
which just shows that you're doing the same thing. It is going to grow and it's pretty much exponential growth as well. Mm. Um, if it's working for other people and they've maybe got a different end goal or some people don't even seem to have an end goal, they're just doing it for the love of it. Like, yeah, it's, it can work for you as long as you're willing to put the work in and not get discouraged at the start because you will see uh, very little return, right? And I'd say a really, a really big thing is to switch your perspective. If you get a view, like a video goes out and you think it would do really well and 10 people watch it, that can be disheartening because there's videos out there where a million people have viewed it, a billion or whatever the, the magical number is. Um, but at the end of the day, if t- those 10 people showed up to a talk you wanted to give and there were 10 people in front of you and they wanted to listen to your message, that's important, right? It's mm. the same principle. You've had an effect on those 10 people. If Once you get that perspective, that even if you only speak to 10 people, one of them really likes what you do and wants to make a connection with you, that one person could be someone from a huge company yeah. at the end of the day that wants to help move you onto that next level. Or they're the artists that you want to know, or like in my, play, my case, the guys from Waves, the guys from IK Multimedia, Multiplier, a bunch of other artists that have reached out. Um, like Imogen Heap recently, that's awesome. Mm. Just from putting it out there in the first place. Whereas if you get discouraged and you don't do it, and you don't have that perspective of it's only got to be that one person, yeah, that's, that's the real trick to it, I'd say. The perspective switch more than anything. So you mentioned you say you have a video that's got 10, 10 plays, 10, 10 views, yeah. and then in your case, if not the biggest, one of the biggest is the BTX video. Yeah, that's been usurped now. What's that mean? Um, uh, what did I do? I did the most simple video of how to install new plugins on FL Studio, but I did it in like a really con- like concise four minutes. This is how you go through the process. Uh, and I think that's that's doubled what the BSX really? had done. Yeah, just it was just literally answering a question from someone that had asked. It's like, oh crap, actually a whole bunch of people want this information. Um, like that video actually generates income on its own to the point I don't have to worry about it. It's not affiliated, nothing like that. Um, but it was just really, really useful for people. So I, I haven't checked it for probably a month, but it was at like 150,000. Wow. Yeah. I just from the most boring thing, right? This is how you install a new plugin on this version of FL Studio. Uh, apparently lots of people were also wondering the same thing, but. That's another thing of uh, probably only a few people had asked a question even relevant to that. And I saw that one question. I was like, well, actually, yeah, I can cover that in sort of like four or five minutes. I'll help out this one individual that's escalated into like 150,000 and climbing. I have no mm. idea what it's at right now. We can look it up in a sec. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so would you say having like that sort of feedback loop is really, as a YouTube channel, as a content creator, is really valid to have with what your audience wants. Yeah, listen to people when they ask things and say things. Um, you'll get like comments, emails, just general things that are not helpful, are abusive, are aggressive. But equally, you'll get genuine questions from people who are just looking for a hand and you're maybe one step ahead of where they are. Mm. Like if you listen to those people, because they probably represent a huge volume of other people who are wondering the same thing and just haven't asked you. Um, yeah, massively like listen to what other people say and ask. I actually keep a, a massive to-do list of questions asked um, and like people's general wonderings just so... If at some point I'm looking to create a video, I'm like, mm, what can I really do? Oh, such and such has asked this, and a bunch of other people have. Cool, let's cover that subject, because it's going to help at least these five guys that have taken the time to reach out to me. I help those five guys out. It might only get viewed by those five guys, but great, I've done something for them. That's a nice relationship built up straight away. Um, it's more than likely, though, but that other people are in that same boat. Mm. And if people are asking it, it's usually not been answered coherently or in the way that these guys are able to grasp it. That's another really good thing. Like I could cover exactly the same subject as someone else, but it will ring home the way I do it 
for those particular people and not others. And the other video that's out there doing whatever it is will ring home for a different group of people. Yeah, yeah. Different analogies, different ways of explaining, different accents, different tempos, they all matter. So when people go, oh, it's, a, it's really saturated doing this thing, it's like, yeah, do you know what? It is. But people are looking for their individual way of doing it. Like people resonate with certain artists and music for mm. the same sort of reason. You have a connection to that individual, or that sound, or the way things are done. Same principle applies at the end of the day. Like saturation is never something to worry about if you're doing good content. Awesome. As a listener of today's episode, you have the opportunity to win a place on an online course. This online course, 21 Ways to Monetize Your Music, and it's created by Warrior Sound, today's podcast partner. This course breaks down how you can turn your music to be an asset to make income from so many different streams so you can go full-time with music. And as you will already know from the intro, we have not one, not two, but 10 passes to give away to the course. So in all honesty, you've got a high chance of being on the online course. So my question to you is, do you fancy the chance of winning the 21 Ways to Monetize Your Music online course? If so, head over to yourmusicindustry.com slash win to be in the chance of winning your place. I've got a few questions aimed at more listeners who'd be interested in either starting a YouTube or growing it. Yeah. So first would be, how long did it actually take you to make anything from your channel? Was it a really long process? Make anything as in like make a profit? Yeah, make a profit. Um, I'll be honest, I don't really know. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't dive into YouTube with the focus of becoming a YouTube millionaire or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it makes regular money. I don't really know how long it took. Uh, it'll be this October and I've only been doing it three years. So if we wind back maybe six months um, before it made like the first check from YouTube. Um, if you guys don't know, like, the way AdSense works on YouTube, ads play before your video, that racks up income, that stacks up in something called AdSense, which Google owns. Uh, you have to break a hundred pounds, I think a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars, and it will pay out to you. Um, and you can stack that up month over month. I believe now you've got to have over a thousand subscribers and 4,000 minutes of watch time um, before you can start doing that. Uh, my channel had been sat idle for, I don't know, years. It was just my general YouTube account and was somehow already approved. Mm. Um, so it started making technically like, money right away. But then when a hundred people watch a video and your channel's not really got any authority, people don't actually advertise on it. It's not entirely how it works. You get advertised that based on your demographic, but then, uh, big popular channels are prioritized anyway. Yeah. It just makes sense. Like they've got brand awareness, the right kind of people are watching it. So it didn't really make anything. Um, the first like brand deal, I probably made a brand deal before I got any payment. Um, cause I've got zero problem with sending a thousand emails and getting 10 replies from people who go, yeah, actually we wanted to show this. Like, um, OEK, uh, Soothe. I think it was Soothe. It was like one of the first ones I, I did and I sort of did it for free reached out to them, they sent me the plugin, I did the video, uh, and then they supplied me with an affiliate link afterwards. It was probably one of the first ones to make money. I think that still gets viewed now. Every time they do a sale, I see like a little bump on uh, viewership. Mm. Uh, I'd say six months, but I wouldn't put a time on it. If you're going yeah. to do it as a business, uh, focus on getting sponsorships from out the gate, but you're going to need to have some kind of audience first. If you have no audience, don't expect to get paid for anything. You've, you've got to... You've got to be able to offer value to somebody else or to something else for them to pay you for it. Yeah. Uh, I think six months is a realistic time. Like, uh, I'm in a few like mentor groups for YouTube and things like that, like private groups. I've seen people start channels and have them like bigger than mine and more profitable in a matter of months. Uh, and you meet people like, yeah, I'm six years in and they're still at like 10,000 subscribers or whatever. And it completely depends on what you're doing, who it resonates with. 
you, you could really play the game and make it purely about money. But I generally think people see through that. Yeah. Like if this podcast was all about making a profit, there'd be ads every 15 minutes <laughs> and it, like it wouldn't bring the value. So people wouldn't listen to it. And in the end, it would tail off, right? It's, mm. you, you got to support people first. I think that answers it. Yeah. So for people who are going into the world of YouTube, could you maybe offer your biggest tip or your biggest few tips on running a YouTube channel? whether it's related to what you're posting, whether it's related to when you're posting or the mindset of it all. Okay, so uh, the biggest tip I could give, I could be really cheesy and like sum it up into three things. Okay, let's do it. So we could do like bring value to someone, be consistent and be genuine. Um, if we break those down, like bring value to someone means don't, necessarily post for your own self-indulgence bring value to somebody else as in answer a question um, show them how to do something educate them in some way value can be entertainment as well like just entertain someone for 10 minutes that's value to their life that's what they were looking for at that time um, be consistent means almost exactly what the sentence says but like consistently do the same thing but not just like put videos out on the same day um, consistency in your branding, consistency in your tone and delivery and the type of content you're doing, consistency in the way that you like help and support others, consistency in what you're generally doing. Is it entertainment? Is it education based? Is it around a particular software? I mean, I branch out a little bit now, but everything is around digital audio. Mm. That's what people come to my channel for. That's what people find. That's what people stay for. If I suddenly start doing like, I don't know, two minute entertainment skits about random things, it's going to throw people off. So like consistency in everything as a whole, uh, almost like pick your niche. Think of it as a musical genre, right? You, you don't make your name as a house producer and then start throwing out your drum and bass track here unless your name's Sigma and you've had the number one because they just do what they want. <laughs> but yeah, you've got to like keep that consistent brand. People find you for that thing. They follow you for that thing. They enjoy you for that thing. And then if you throw a curveball that way, they generally don't like it. So yeah, consistent in that respect. Uh, and then be genuine as in, you know, are, what, what are you doing it for? So for me, it's always linked back to Warrior Sound. Um, there's always been some kind of like brand deal and things going on to keep it going. But it's about answering questions and helping people out in a way that I didn't have. Mm. Um, so like I'm, I'm old as hell. So if you rewind back to like when I got my hands on reason two to learn anything about it, I could read the manual or find someone else in the world who'd been using it. And that was it for resource of information. Um, whereas now if you've got a question about something, you can hit YouTube and there's usually someone there ready to give you an answer. But that allows you to build a community that you didn't have back then as well. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of people don't understand that now because it's just there and available. Um, but if it was to suddenly disappear, it would be massively missed. So like, be genuine in the purpose that you're trying to do, the, the thing you're trying to get over. So like, help people out with digital audio, simple thing, but that is the goal and that is the genuine purpose. But I do want to tie it back into a bigger brand so I can keep doing that and move on to like uh, get people as independent artists making a living as well. Yeah. So there's a bigger mission there, but it starts with the small thing. And if you're interested in this small thing, you're probably interested in the bigger thing that we're trying to move to. Mm. Okay. Those have been my biggest three. And I think on that note, that totally sums up the YouTube section of the podcast because we've covered a lot on your journey into YouTube, why you do it, and then also some tips on people. So you touched upon then Sigma, drum and bass. <laughs> yeah. So unders as an artist, you are a drum and bass kind of producer artist, would you? Yeah, argue? I'd put myself maybe in like soulful drum and bass. Soulful Generally, and bass. every now and then we throw out a harder tune, of course, mm. uh, and some like mix ups and maybe tone it down a little bit to go into breaks because you can't just have everything drum and bass 24 7 there's got to be it's like an ebb and flow in that but yeah generally soulful drum and bass i guess generally positive moods like saxophones brass with the odds like moody thing thrown in here and there awesome 
So one of your latest releases is Like a Fool, which is my, after Loose Brass, it's my favorite um, okay. track, of favorite unders track. So I've recently seen a post on your Facebook page about rejection, about how you've received probably now way over 27 rejection emails related to that track alone. I'd love to explore how how you deal with rejection and your mindset around it as it can be painful. Yeah, and re- rejection is a really hard one. And I've seen it end bigger artists than myself. Um, and we've seen many artists struggle with it. And the more you grow, the more it exists as well. Obviously, the more support and things you get, but then like haters grow and bigger platforms will suddenly reject you and things like that. And it hurts at the end of the day. Um, the, the way of dealing with it is approaching it with like quite an analytical and business mindset, but also you do need to develop a thick skin uh, and sometimes take a step back and like listen to or read that thing that has been said to you and that rejection Uh, and see it from their perspective rather than your personal perspective is a big one. Mm. So I, like someone who purposely doesn't like my music, they they just dislike it for whatever reason, that's fine. My perspective is I didn't make it for you. I'm sorry to have wasted two and a half minutes of your time for however long you listen to the track. It wasn't made for you. That's, That's fine. But when, like, the what you're talking about here is I put the track out to loads of different promos. So releasing a track you guys should be familiar that you try and get it everywhere you can like playlists uh like uploads on youtube radio play whatever it is you're going for at the time um and as you get a little bit more of a name and you've got a little bit of weight behind you you get more responses than just getting blanked by everyone however with those responses you can get a lot of rejection and negative feedback and feedback that is contradictory. So I can think straight away of, uh, I had one reply that was like, absolutely love this, want it as an instrumental, hate the vocal, not going to support it. All right, okay, great, that's fine. And then maybe three or four after that was love the vocal, hate the instrumental. It's like, <laughs> cool. So how, I don't quite know how to win this one. That's fine. At the end of the day, it just wasn't for them and they are controlling whatever platform it is they were doing, whether it was a Spotify playlist or mm. the radio play, whatever they're doing. That's it's down to them, and they've got to curate that. Uh, and like switching to their mindset, at the end of the day, how many times have you watched a show on Netflix, got halfway through the episode and gone, yeah, this is awful, and just moved on to something else? They've just done the same thing. Uh, mm. The person that made that Netflix show had put their life into it, in writing it, directing it sitting and color grading all the footage, checking it for continuity. They did the same thing that you did with your music, um, but it was dismissed just as quickly by you. It's just the same thing happening back to you. And once you switch out to that perspective, it's not so bad. Um, to be honest, like the, si- the complete silence in the early days probably is harder because you just don't know what to do. You don't know what's going on. Mm. Um, and you kind of, you can put it in a little compartment, if you will, Like you can take it all and collate it. And if you look at it all as purely data, like if every fifth person said they really didn't like the vocal, actually, well, maybe I was wrong in this. Maybe that is actually a thing that I need to look at in the future and we can do better on that. And treat it as analytical, treat it as a learning experience. You can't just expect everything to go positive all the time. Mm. And like uh, rejection doesn't necessarily come off as hate as well if you don't if you treat it analytically and you take it as a whole like it shouldn't offend you the ones that are annoying are when you sometimes um i can't remember if it's google or itunes i put my album out and like the first review said this is not house music and i was like well no it's not and it's listed under drum and bass (laughs) but i can't do anything about that and it's now the first thing it's got everyone sees it's got a one-star review (laughs) okay, uh, I don't really know what to do about that. And you kind of just got to laugh that off. Like, what are you supposed to do about it? Now, it turns out in hindsight, and I think you highlighted this to me, was that another artist had a hit under my name mm. that was a house tune, and everything started getting tied in together. Uh, and I, I don't know if that is what tied it all together. But things like that, like, 
it's, it's rejection. You've instantly got a one star review. Now, if you share that to anyone, it's got a one star review on it as well. And you just you kind of got to laugh it off and just accept what's happened. Uh, kind of embrace it, if you will. Mm. I think that's, yeah, it's probably about right. And when you look at YouTube as well, you get a horrendous amount on there because. So the thing with YouTube, you've not reached out to an individual either. Um, and you've usually got an anonymous person generally trying to be toxic. Um, you've got to flip that perspective as well. That person has actively sought out your content and they've taken the time to be overly like vicious and toxic about something you've made. That person's probably going through something. Yeah. I have never once wasted minutes of my time doing something like that. I've got better things to be doing. Uh, and again, like flip that perspective. Like it wasn't for them, but honestly, like what are they going through that they feel the need to be like that? And if you go through my YouTube, you'll find plenty of these because I don't delete them, but I'll respond to them. Um, usually like with a question, the amount of times you just don't get any kind of response or you get, uh, some kind of like bait response where this is really what they do for fun. Um, one recently, I don't remember what the initial discussion was for, but like I posted like a proper correct response of like, oh, you know, we can do blah, 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 blah. And his response was, I'm something along the lines of, oh, you keep playing little producer boy son. I've got a much better studio than you or something with 30 years experience. I was like, really? Like you've been doing this for 30 years and you behave like this? <sighs> like, like you read it and it's sort of, it goes into you a little bit and sort of sinks a little bit into the skin and you just take a step back from that and just go, actually, like, why would you be behaving like that? Yeah. You're just trying to get a raise out of someone. Uh, another great thing with that is the more like momentum you build and the more of those little relationships we're talking about earlier that you nurture. Um, sometimes before I've even uh, got to the comment, someone else has replied. The really? problem with that is you'll find that people that are on your side... Um, <laughs> yeah, they can be a little bit protective and a little bit too supportive and maybe aggressive. But uh, again, they're kind of falling for the bait. Uh, the, the biggest thing I can say is take a step back from it. Try and see it from their perspective. I guess almost empathize. It's not really empathy because empathy is like understanding someone else's situation. But look at what they're trying to do, mm. what they're trying to achieve. And did, does your thing actually support them? And in so many cases, like I, I stick to that. You know, you didn't enjoy it. That's fine. Like I didn't make it for you. I made it for the people who do enjoy it. Yeah. Um, you know, don't waste your time on me in the future. That's absolutely fine at the end of the day. We're just not going to be able to connect that way. Mm. It can be hard that though, can't it? Because like making a video, making an album, making a film, it's a piece of you. So when someone doesn't like it, it's hard to take yourself out of that isn't it yeah you've, you've got to kind of look at it in the bigger picture with the bigger perspective which... that's it and like getting that bigger perspective takes you of grabbing your emotion that instant because it's it, someone says something horrible towards you whether it's written in a comment or an email or it's someone you've actively reached out to it does sink into the skin a little bit really quickly you do have to build up a little bit of a thicker skin mm. and every now and then there'll be one that catches like some kind of insecurity that I've still got hidden in the back of my mind. I'll lay down at night and it will run through again. It's like, what? what's that thought doing back there? Like, we put that to one side. Um, so like, I'm not perfect at it, but I, I've had enough of it now that I, I can switch that perspective. And that's the biggest thing I can say. Like, think of their point of view. If someone's being overly toxic and hateful, why? There's something wrong. They're wasting their time trying to be hateful. And this is going to sound harsh and horrible to some degree but they are not going to get anywhere in life and most of the time like people who come and watch my videos they're trying to make music and do the next thing and all I'm trying to do is help and if that's going to be their attitude they have absolutely no chance in getting in anywhere in the industry and if they're going to respond like that when someone criticizes work that they make um it's just going to be like a toxic explosion that won't go anywhere mm -hmm. and in terms of the rejection after rejection after rejection when you try and put a track out just sit and look at their perspective and just gonna, you know it wasn't for them and if they were to tie this thing that they're not passionate about to their thing then what does it actually say about them as well you know, by the same extent as i get sent demos and tracks to review and stuff every now and then i'm like 
I'm not going to put them out. I'm not going to like tie them onto my channel. Um, I'll recommend things we can do to maybe get them to the next stage. But I'm not going to necessarily display that music because it doesn't attach to what I'm after. I get asked all the time how to, um, if I can do like a future base tutorial, how to make future base continuously. I've never made a future base track in my life. Yeah. And my response, even in email, if you email me and say that, is usually I've never made a future base track. It's not something I feel I could do. There's probably better people out there to reach to. That's like honest. It's the same thing. I just rejected them. So you've yeah. got to tie that perspective in. And I say, think each time you reject something now, whether you skip through a show or you leave a negative review on Amazon, just think you've just done exactly the same thing. Think about why you've done it. And hopefully that will help you deal with it a little bit better. It's like that phone call I just had, I just rejected it. There you go. <laughs> and like, if that was your other half, she's going to be <laughs> devastated right now. But... Thank God it wasn't. <laughs> So talking of my other half, you have a family as well as having a part-time job and working in the music industry. Yeah. How do you balance all that? Because it's a struggle I have myself, so I know there's a lot of other people in the world that do. How does Scott balance work, life, family, everything? Um, all right, well, the first thing, we'll, we'll tackle the, the part-time job thing. Um, initially, so if we run, rewind about 12 months... That was a regular, normal job, and I had to come in at those set hours, and there were set times and things like that. In this time, everything else I've built up, I've been able to flip that. Now, I'm at the same company, I'm doing a different job, mm. getting paid a lot more, uh, and I only have to give basically two days a week, which is a total of 16 hours. And I get to say pretty much when that's going to be. So... Uh, like leveraging what I've built myself it was like, I, like the intent was to leave, um, but there was actually something I could do that was a lot bigger. So I essentially what I do is deliver training. I actually like do training on um, like Garage Band Logic and things like that with staff and other members of the team and general like uh, digital creativity um, sort of thing that not. Lots of people are interested in, but there's not a lot of like ways to get info. It's essentially what I'm doing for that company. Mm. So leveraging what I was already doing, I was able to work that in. So it's not a massive, I don't want to say inconvenience, but uh, not a massive drain. I know when these days are going to occur and they're kind of on my terms. Um, like with having a family, again, we can rewind only 11 months now. And uh, like the baby was born and it was... I'm not going to lie, still really difficult to balance at times. Um, I, I had to make a cull on some of the things I was doing. So my podcast, that got cut. That got cut that month. Um, I think about two months later, I cut the clothing line as well. And that was literally, look at everything. What is uh, supporting me the most? It's like 80-20 principle. Yeah, yeah, really. What was what's bringing 80% of my like income and livelihoods and what's not, and those things fell in the 20%. The clothing line's something I'll probably bring back over time. Um, like The beautiful thing about that is all the assets are created. I've got all those custom T-shirt designs and things. I can literally just reactivate them. I could, if I get invited to YouTube's um, new Teespring program, just have my own custom t-shirts on there straight away. So there's assets already created for something that doesn't uh, necessarily exist yet. Yeah. So there's no loss there. And it, it was profitable just if I didn't include my time. Uh, and yet my time suddenly became way more valuable. So that had to be cut. Um, and, and that's it really, like managing sensibly what, what brings the, the most value to what I'm trying to achieve. One of my pet hates is when I have a conversation with someone and I'll give them like a consistent plan to get on the route they're trying to go. Like, ah, oh, but I don't have time. And it's like, cool, but your Facebook status says you were playing FIFA at 10 o'clock last night. Uh, and you said you went to bed about one. So, you know, that's a good solid three, four hours of FIFA there. You could have been doing something else with that time. And then the other ones, I have no money. It's like, okay, cool. So again, you've got a PlayStation Online count, that's 50 quid a year. That's 50 quid in ads. Uh, FIFA, what's that? 60, 70 quid now. Cool, okay, so we're getting to the 100 mark. You could have put that into advertising. If you get even half back what you put in, you would have had 150 for the next time. 
uh, and you self sabotaging like excuses like that I don't like. So the managing time, um, I cut probably for two years, yeah, probably about two years, everything that wasn't going to bring me towards my goal. Mm. And I mean everything. Uh, like PlayStation probably stayed plugged in, but didn't get turned on. Um, watching TV, Game of Thrones, and whatever show. I don't know, actually know what shows are really out anymore. I've still got that on a cull. Um, I watch something mind numbing every now and then, just when I'm really burnt <laughs> out. I usually put it on in the background and I'll be doing like emails while I'm just so it's there as like a noise and I'll take it in. Usually something educational as well, to be honest. So yeah. I can maybe learn something in the background. Who knows? Um, but yeah, cut those things out. Like if, if you really want this, cut out all that crap because there's loads of extra free time and like the no time excuse. I just don't tolerate. Um, if you prioritize the things you really want to do, there's time for them. You can make the time for them. And great one, like whenever uh, I do a project with Waves, like a new plugin comes out, they release their new plugin at, I think, like 11.30 here, UK time. It's like, mm. cool, that's awesome. I'm going to download that. I'm going to test it out. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to read the manual. I'm going to create the video. I'm going to edit it and it'll be uploaded before I go to bed. So like 4 a.m., 5 a.m., that's finished and uploaded. Make sure it's optimized as well before I go to sleep. Make sure some views start coming in. Yeah, that's doing exactly what it should do. Perfect. Now I can go to sleep for three hours. Get up and repeat. Don't have to do that. Three every... hours of sleep. Yeah, sometimes. You don't have to do that every time. But when that commitment drops in and waves being way in my 80-20 principle in terms of income generation, I'm going to support them as much as I can. Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, I'm going to cut out sleep if need be. Um, and because I've cut out other areas, it's easy to do that every now and then. Um, the other beauty of mainly operating on your own terms is that if I do need to work really late like that, and the next day I can cut something else out, I can get up later if I want, or just not set an alarm. Mm. Um, it's a bad habit to get into. And there's absolutely people out there who reach that point and then they just let it all slide by not having a routine um, and if you've ever heard of Jocko you'll know oh, good old Jocko exactly 4.30am <laughs> yeah 4.30am <laughs> yeah, Instagram watch pick but uh, like the discipline freedom thing it, it makes sense right mm. if you keep yourself disciplined you will get these things done each day uh, and it is discipline to cut out doing loads of things you enjoy you don't have to do that forever but while you want to get your foot in the door and get things moving that's what you've got to do um, that's the reality of time management is cutting out things that don't move you forward and like you've got audacity to want to leave a regular job and go and do your own thing like, it's, it's audacious at the end of the day like who, who are you to go and do that um, so the time commitment can be massive but you don't have to do that forever like Mortal Kombat comes out in a couple of days I am having the day off and I'm playing Mortal Kombat like <laughs> That's been me since I was a kid. I remember playing that in the arcade. Um, but I don't, what was the last, last thing I bought before that? Can't remember. I like, haven't played anything like that for ages mm. because I cut it out and focus on what can move me to the next level. And because it's doing something I already enjoy, I don't massively miss cutting out those like inane, catching up on Game of Thrones or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So. That's my time management tip. Be ruthless and cut out those random things that don't get you anywhere. If you want to be a full-time gamer, amazing. Play games as much as you can, but record your footage, stream it, do whatever you can to get you to that stage. Don't just inanely play games. Like It doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. Yeah? That was long. <laughs> I, I want to go into it a little bit deeper because you were talking about cutting things off and... Yep prioritizing on what will move you forward but say pre-baby you've got your partner and mm -hmm. you've also got running and having a healthy routine how do you still so say your relationship with your partner and your like routine with going for a run etc sure is that like a block of time that's always set and then everything else is work and sleep time or how how does that work Okay, so if we were pre-baby, um, 
health and fitness wise, I would probably run two to three times a week. I would gym five times a week at minimum. Mm. That pretty much all died. I cut that away because at the end of the day, my income of business for the time being is more important than my health. Now, um, like we were discussing earlier, I, if I see like I've got 30, 40 minutes and videos are exploring, I can't really do anything else. There's nothing else to tick off on my to-do list. Shorts go on, trainers go on like that for a run. I'll yeah. just optimize that time. Same time, I'll probably put podcast or uh, audio book on something that I can also pick up from at the same time and just like compound on that little time block. Videos are exploring, so stuff's getting done. Uh, that means I'm going to send those off to whatever company it is and get paid. I'm out for a run, so I'm getting to fitness and I'm learning something new yeah. in like an hour block in total. Um, fitness got massively cold and I was ultra, ultra fit. Um, I've got a run image pinned on my phone where I did a 10K and maintained a six-minute mile three days before the baby was born and that's my goal to get back to that. I'm currently about 16 minutes too slow. <laughs> um, but I'm still out there doing it and it gives me a goal. And the same thing I said really earlier, I've now set the goal. So I'll just go and maintain until I get mm. back to that goal. Um, having it set is a big important part. But yeah, you can't always fit everything in. For the time being, while I've got a little baby, um, fitness is pretty much on the back burner but I do it as and where I can like I cram it in because at the end of the day if I let myself get completely unwell everything else falls apart yeah so yeah um yeah and then the we we're gonna look at recommendations weren't we so the thing that kind of brought me round to self-development so I'd always been up for uh, like learning new techniques like I read behind the glass and things like that uh, the one that really brought it round to me was Ask Gary V. Uh, it just so happened that literally when that came out, someone that I had connected with relatively recently recommended it. And I was like, all right, fine, I'll grab the audio book the second the audio book comes out. Uh, and went through it and it had so much in it that I hadn't thought about or considered um, that I couldn't even take it all in. So I like rewound a bit, applied some of it carried on for like three months, listened to it again. And then I learned something new because I applied some of the other things, the like other little diamonds that were kind of rough had shined up a bit. And I understood mm. them more. Uh, and that kind of got me hooked. And from there, I started hammering through, uh, I did 24 plus a year since that came out, which I want to say three, maybe four years ago now. I'm not 100% when. Mm. Um, but some that have had a massive impact on me. So sell or be sold. By Grant Cardone, um, he's like he's going to be marmite. Is probably the best term. Like you're either going to love him or hate him. I think he's excellent. Um, if you can overlook the fact that he's a Scientologist, then <laughs> then you're absolutely fine. If you dwell on that fact and you don't take what's being taught in Sell or Be Sold with you, then you've missed the entire point of the book. Anyway, um, like if you listen to Sell or Be Sold it will trigger something in you that really helps you understand like how and why a product sold. Um, you'll have an amazing understanding of how companies like Apple work as well. Mm. And if that book really rings home, I'd move on to um, be obsessed or be average from him as well. If it doesn't really ring home for you, like ignore that. But if it does, like move on to that book because it really builds on everything to how that exists and how he took that principle uh, and went and did his whole 10x thing and like dude's on the billionaire list now and yet he was broke at like 30 so it's an, it's an incredible learn to take from that and the other one I guess would be Ask Gary V the thing that sort of started yeah. me down the path of uh, checking out self-development books just because you might listen to the whole thing and just get one gem from it but if you listen to it and apply that the next time you go through it and you will need to go through it multiple times um, 10 more things will stand out. There's so much covered in there that it, it's, I don't want to say a Bible, but it's near on a Bible of like um, social media information. And there's bits specifically tailored towards music, but then everything applies if yeah. you think about it uh, and you really apply it. And again, Gary's like pretty high energy. Pretty he, high energy. Yeah, he's pr <laughs> pretty, pretty high energy. Um, and like some people will disregard him straight away for that. 
Um, but like stick with it and like listen to what he's really got to say. If you don't want to go through the book, you can watch his YouTube. I don't personally watch his YouTube videos because as far as I'm concerned, he's got like three messages and he just drives those messages home in different ways and different metaphors over and over. And I think I've grasped what he's trying to say. Um, but yeah, ask, ask Gary V is like the most common questions answered and like it essentially comes down to like humility and staying humble with what you're doing and don't get in your own way looking at you Dan <laughs> um, and putting in, putting in the work so sort of what I said earlier in fact um, like looking at what you really want to do and what you need to cut out and how you can get there it's, it's just an awesome book I'm assuming you've listened yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Read it, like yeah. it yeah you have to go through it multiple times yeah um, another one let's try and throw a bit of more of a curveball in um, Total Recall Arnold Schwarzenegger. Really? I've, yeah. I haven't read that. Or you haven't read that. Listen. Okay. So um, not only will you learn a huge amount about Arnie, but there's so many lessons to be learned like, in that book. And it's a really good read. Um, like learning the fact that he like, is such humble beginnings. He started off in literally a stone house with two rooms in the middle of nowhere. That is where he lived and grew up. Um, and then to get where he got to without being able to speak English, without having like any endorsements, he just went and did these things. He's like, someone will say to him, this is what you need to do to be in films. And he was like, okay, so I've got to become some kind of actor or have some kind of uniqueness about me. I've got to somehow get to Hollywood. He's like, okay, so step one, job at a gym, get fit. Can't do that. Okay, join the military. Carried on getting fit in the military as a tank driver eventually got discharged. Uh, this time now he's super fit. He's using the military to bulk up a bit. Manages to get a job in Germany in a gym recruiting. So without a second thought, leaves home, has nowhere to live, leaves home, goes to this job in Germany and does that until he can get ultra fit and he's learned a load about sales. Now he's done that, he finds a way to get the same job in the US and moves to the US and that's where the like legend of Gold's Gym starts. And like, for like what he did and what he went through and all of the years before he started making money in films it's just so worth a listen mm. um, things like so when he was becoming popular at Gold's Gym he one of his first business ventures was he just sold signed photos of himself for people that had visited Gold Gym but super simple thing uh, and all the time he was doing that because it didn't pay enough he had a bricklaying firm with loads of other bodybuilders he met because they were really happy to do bricklaying because it's like working out or then getting paid. <laughs> like the geniusness of that, it's, uh, it's well worth a listen. Um, he like frankly admits some of the terrible mistakes he's made as well and uh, some of the, the like horrible like dealing with hate. So like Arnie had to deal with some horrendous things about his dad being a Nazi and all sorts of stuff like that. That's, mm. that's proper like slander against you. Um, and how to deal with that, that covers really, really well. Um, and then what when he's sort of near the end of his acting career deciding he wants to be governor of California and just executing on that to the point he somehow became governor of California as this guy who grew up in Austria and couldn't speak English in a stone house like it's, it's worth a listen <laughs> or worth a read however you want to go through it it's a yeah, really yeah. good book you've sold me on that one <laughs> yeah it's well worth a read um, there's a whole bunch of others mm. I could go through but we'd be talking for hours otherwise I think the one I'd like to mention that you recommended to me is Seth oh. Godin's This Is Marketing. Oh my God. Like, yeah. Uh, it, like the principles it teaches are really, really simple, but the mm -hmm. way Seth going kind of explains them and gets you to like see it from a different perspective is incredibly good. And uh, yeah, that's, that's one that again, you can listen to, apply to what you're doing with your music, with your business, whatever it is you're trying to do test it and then go back and listen to the book again because then after you've applied that bit the another bit will make more sense to you and you can just keep stacking on stacking on um yeah that's yeah it's a really yeah. really 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 good book um it ties in really well to sell or be sold to be honest as well like the principle of um like sell or be sold is essentially you believing 100% in the thing that you want someone to buy, whether that be your music or a phone or you're trying to sell your bike in the paper. Like you believe that it's going to be better for that person 
Uh, and then the marketing principle that ties into that just works really, really well. Like these are really dry subjects to talk about, but when if you're if you're a musician, you're an entrepreneur at the end of the day. Unless yeah. you, unless you're looking to gun for a label, in which case you've still got to build up all the momentum and do all these things anyway. You're going to have some kind of knowledge around it. Um, yeah, you need to sort of dig into these subjects big, big time. And yeah, Seth Godin's This Is Marketing. Yeah, such a good book. Mm. I've got one last question before yep. the final question and it's one that I do ask every guest as it does it creates some really interesting responses so I should remember it <laughs> so what change would you like to see in the music industry in the next three to five years the change that I would like to see is artists and people who really do want to be successful having the resources to understand and execute that on their own rather than struggling mm. um, like at the minute I feel that 99% of the information is out there but people massively struggle from uh, they don't know what they don't know right so they don't know what to look for and there's not necessarily a place to piece it all together um, it is what I'm trying to build, but it's a, it's a big undertaking at the end of the day, much bigger than I ever planned for it to be. Um, but yeah, like that, that understanding and all the different things you can do. So like I did that live webinar a little while ago of like 21 ways you can monetize music. Mm. Uh, and people go like, you've got YouTube and you've got streaming and you've got iTunes and you've maybe got merch and then they kind of like pilfer off and they don't really know what else you can do. And I just give like these 21 like practical different options you can do. I think that information being more readily out there will help a massive amount of people. Um, even if the only thing you want to do is make music, that I don't want to say necessarily is not going to happen. Like even if you go to a label, nowadays a label, they'll be looking to book you for DJ shows or book you for live performance and they'll be taking a cut of that and then they'll be getting your music out there and promo promoting it and they'll want you to be part of that promo as well and yeah, yeah. doing Twitter and things like that. So you've got to have like an understanding of how all that works already anyway. Uh, but I don't believe the info's out there and the people who find all the info and put the extra work in are currently the ones that succeed or necessarily the ones that have got money behind them and I think that's wrong yeah um, especially like probably my favorite example in recent history we, we all have seen like Paris Hilton become like a top level top 10 DJ she bought her way there she did not necessarily earn it uh, and that's a massive front to women in the industry because there's loads of female DJs out there who could run rings around her and know more about music and didn't buy a production album, although thank you for Banksy for destroying her, uh, <laughs> her release. That was awesome. But like that, that attitude to me destroys it and it hurts people's work ethic when they can just see someone buy their way in like that mm. uh, purely simply because they, they don't know the process to get there. Yeah even more so for women in the industry. So that, that's the big change. I'd like to see people have a place they can go or places they can go to learn the whole process and get there themselves without having any of the horrendousness that sometimes comes around it. Um, you know, places like SAE. I went through SAE in uh, 2015, 2014, 2015, a while ago now. And... Like the business segment was one, super out of date, and two, far too small. Like yeah. way, way, way too small. And it was out of date in like, you know, this is how labels operate and this is how we can put out physical music and blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's just not how it works anymore now. And like, I knew that at the time and it, nothing still really changed. Even places like Point Blank, they, they do music business, but it's like how a label operates. Uh, and yeah, an independent artist now has the power to do the whole thing themselves anyway. I get it. It's not how everyone wants to operate, but there's no one really teaching it and bringing people there. So like, like Liverpool Audio Network has got the potential to be that incubator, right? Mm. And I would like to see that on a much larger scale to really bring artists out and get them fairly paid, integrate the whole lot into one system rather than this scatter of information. Sam, 
that's, I hope that's that summed it up. Yeah, that definitely summed it up. So where can people find you online? Um, warriorsound.co.uk. Um, there's free courses at warriorsound.pro and YouTube forward slash unders. Simple. Well, thank you very much, Scott, for being a part of the show. That's been one mammoth of an episode, so thank you very much. You're more than welcome. It's a good day. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thank you. Seriously, what a fantastic episode with Scott. Like, yeah, literally a mammoth of an episode. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Scott from Warrior Sound for being on the podcast and for also being this podcast collaborator. So you have the chance to win Warrior Sound's 21 Ways to Monetize Your Music online course. Head over to yourmusicindustry.com slash win to be within the chance of winning. But other than that, Your Music Industry returns next week with another episode. So I will see you then. Have a fantastic and creative week.